Wow, that was wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. It uh, seems odd, nine weeks not preaching, but with a uh, heart attack and quadruple bypass, that's just how it goes. But God is healing and strengthening me. Now, there are some that were saying, oh, well, Pastor, God's telling you to slow down. I say baloney. <laughs> because I could have easily died at home. I could have died on driving 40, 70 miles an hour on 105, all the, 45 minutes over to Montgomery. I could have died walking across the parking lot hitting my head. I was in the one safe place all the way through was talking to my doctor, and this guy started slapping me in the face. I thought I'm out for a second. I'm out for a minute. He says, I've already called the ambulance. So all along the way, God could have taken me home. But instead, I've got more work for you to do, and uh, what I'm seeing and happening in the world, I've got a lot of work to do. And we have a lot of work to do to here, and uh, God's bringing some things to pass that I've uh, been praying about for a long time, and we'll see what God does with that in the next few weeks. It's very important, though, that a church has unity. Now, see, my part of fulfilling God's vision is for unity in the church. That doesn't mean uniformity. No, we have different talents, different abilities, different points of view. And all of those are extremely helpful because if everybody's just thinking the same way, that's kind of dangerous. You, you need a lot of input if you make wise decisions. But unity in the church is so important to God that it's mentioned more in the Bible than heaven or hell. You may not have realized that. God wants his people working together, loving one another, caring daily. Now, of course, we won't experience real unity until we get to heaven. When Jesus is in charge and you've got the Father and the Holy Spirit, all three of them there, then you've got incredible community going on. But Jesus wants us to practice before we get there. So in John chapter 17, verse 20, Jesus says, I'm praying for all who believe in me because of my disciples' testimony. See, remember this. The world looks at the church, how we are conducting ourselves, and they go, oh, they're great, or hmm, they're, they're squabbling all the time, so people, we don't want to go there. They fight all the time. He says, my prayer for them is that they'll be unified as one, Father, just as you and I are one, may they be unified as one. Now, just as any human parent wants their kids to get along, see, in my family, there were four of us. Um, so, and, one, and my mom, my parents divorced when I was six, and so there was four of us, and one, my mother was four foot eleven. But you didn't try to take on her. She was tough. Uh, you know, she was wise. Uh, Jim Grice put it this way, that's Marva's late husband. you got to get the attention of a child before they're two-year-old or they're, you're ra you'll never get a hold of them. And I say, if you don't do that, you'll raise monsters instead of children. <laughs> so my mother apparently got a, our attention because all it took was her saying, you better do that, we did it. There was no, there was no argument, no, you just had to go do it. Um, and so God wants, you know, what really made her happy is when we got along, didn't fight. Now, the only trouble was my sister Elizabeth came out of the womb fighting me. <laughs> I mean, she, she was always trying to find a way to fight with me. Not my older brother, my sister. And now, who are the two closest of the four? Me and Elizabeth. Yeah. That's how that works out. Now, the last time I preached was January 16th, and to me that feels like years ago. But it's, you know, eight, nine weeks. Now, 
I'm going to give you an overview of what I said. Now, I had 12 points in. I'm just going to tell you, we only have four points today. We had 12 points, so just four, okay? You can hang with me. In the Bible, unity is so important. Consider. One, my unity with other believers is proof I'm saved. See, if you're always fighting with everyone else, you know, you need to check, check your heart instead of checking them. Second, the Trinity as our model for unity. You know, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Three, yet one. Always. Three, Jesus' last prayer. Now, that was John chapter 17. His last prayer before he went and died for our sins was that the members of his church would be in unity. He said, I'm praying I don't want to take them out of the world. See, a lot of times Christians go, well, we just want to get our own little commune and not be infected by the world. He says, no, don't take them out of the world. Keep them in there being salt and light to the world. But he says, I want them to be united as one. Five, our unity is our greatest witness to non-believers. You realize in a small town, yeah, see, I, I've got to behave. You realize that in Navasota? Because, you know, I'm the pastor of the church, I'm a business leader, and so I may not know somebody, but they'll walk up, how you doing, Mr. Brand? I, I heard you had surgery. But see, I put it on Facebook how I'm doing, and it just gets all over town. And so what you're doing in this church, what you're doing around, gets around to the whole community. And of course, what travels faster? Good stuff or bad stuff? <laughs> bad stuff travels like wildfire. So you need to be watching your testimony. You say, well, I don't know those people. It yeah, it does matter because whom you represent is the king of the world, Jesus. You're representing the kingdom of God to this world, and so you need to remember you're an ambassador of Christ. And so since you're an ambassador, you represent the kingdom, and so they judge our kingdom by how you conduct yourself. Very important. And sex, unity removes fear and creates what? Boldness. So you're very secure. You know where you're going. You know who you are. And so you can stand firm because you've got a lot of people protecting your back. Seven, when a church is unified, everyone's needs are met. Why is that? Because you know each other. You love one another. You, you, you are aware that there's a need in the church family, and you quietly take care of that. It's not a big deal. Eight, baptism and communion are two visible signs of unity. What's baptism? You go under the water signifying that before you knew Jesus, what you were dead in your sins. And you rise up out of the water signifying that now Christ has saved you. You're walking in newness of life. You've been transformed by God, born again. What about communion? You have the bread. It reminds us that he died on the cross to pay for our sins. But the juice and the or wine, whichever you prefer to call it, reminds us to share the good news to the world. You know, he didn't come just to die for our sins, but for us to share that so that other people know that there is saving grace in Jesus. Now, and focusing on our common purpose creates unity. See, when we're combined on God's purposes, so you, so you love God with all your heart, so you worship. You uh, disciple people in God's word, so you teach them all things I have ta I've taught you. And also you... Um, you make sure you um, gather for church family. We see we're gathered here. So you do the things that are in need for church, and that is the body of Christ. Uh, Ten, unity begins when we realize we're incomplete without each other. See, if you think you don't need anybody, hmm, you, you are unwise. I tell you what, I really realize how much I need people when um, I convinced them to let me go home on the fourth day. I said, they said well, there'll be people there. Yeah, there'll be people that weekend, but after that, nobody. But I didn't tell them that. They'd make me go to rehab. I'm going to tell you how I escaped from the hospital. 
they get you up on the second day, right? And so five people get around you, husky, strong people. They say, we want you to stand up, but don't worry, we'll catch you if you fall. Hmm. I stood up and took off walking. That's your ticket out of the hospital. You got to walk. They had to chase me down the hall. The next day, they fixed my little red wagon. They had uh, this young, super workout young fellow who was my nurse, Swanee. And I looked over at Swanee, and I looked at them, and I said, I'm not going to outrun him. <laughs> he said, Mr. Brand, I'll have a chair behind you. If you need to sit down, you can just turn around. I never needed the chair. So, but when I got home, there's a problem. Now, a lot of people said, well, pastor, whatever you need. I mean, they, whatever you need, we'll do it. So I put out there, I need food. And you guys organized, you brought food. I mean, I had stuff and more stuff. I still have stuff in my freezer from when y'all brought me food. But I would have starved to death. I mean, you know, you get out of the hospital, you... Okay, I'm in my chair, my recliner, and then I'm over in the bed, and then I make myself walk. But after that, you don't feel like doing anything for the three weeks. Nothing. And so I desperately needed y'all, and y'all were there for me for the first six weeks. And then when I got my driving privileges back, <laughs> so they don't let, well, I kind of snuck out. A little bit. My, my doctor, she's supposed to not drive for six weeks, but my doctor said, well, you can drive around Navasota because you only go about 30 miles an hour. <laughs> yeah, but I snuck up to College Station, yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's part of Navasota, right? College Station, right? Well, I had to get provisions, right? <laughs> so, but then six weeks, I could drive anywhere I wanted, so then I'm, st I'm on my own. I can take care of stuff. But Nobody can do everything alone. You need different people doing different things to make what we call church. And if, so therefore, the, you know, I'm the pastor, but so what? They'll be talking to y'all a whole bunch before I ever speak, and they'll decide long before I ever speak whether they're coming back or not. It's true. So it's very important we all serve together and pull together for God. And 11, Jesus died to unite us, not divide us. Oh, it's so sad how uh, sometimes, you know, I've, been, I've served churches for 40 years now, since 1982. And I, I saw a friend of mine, he, he was serving in a church in another state, and I was concerned when he went there and I, then I saw a post saying, well, I'm looking for a ministry position. I go, mm-hmm. You know, you make, the trouble is, see, I'm the founding pastor, so I'm the first guy here, you know. But you can go in church life, and somebody will cause problems every few years. And they'll decide they don't like the pastor. Well, he's been there for three or four years, and they go, well, you know, Sister Susie's been here for 50 years, so, I mean, he's got to go because we've got to make her happy. You know what? She won't be happy. And it could be Brother Billy. I mean, no matter what happens, if you, and yet churches do that. I'm, I'm, it's very sad because one or two or five people get upset and they don't like a certain pastor, maybe the way he ties his shoes or whether he wears boots or shoes or whatever, or... They don't like, they want this certain version of the Bible only instead of, like I use many, because the Bible is written not in English, it was written, written in Koine Greek and Hebrew. So I'm afraid nobody could read in this room besides me those two. There may be somebody, but so when somebody says, well, this translation is the one, well, no, because it wasn't written in that, that's a, any translation is an interpretation of what the original said. And so you got to watch out saying, well, this is the only one. No, there's many. And, but you got to find what, this, what they were saying. And remember this. You, the best translation right now is the closest to the modern language right now. Because language changes. 
And so you need to update, okay, this is where the language is now so you got the right word so people can understand it. I tell you, if, if you took the, now it, it's kind of funny to me. What we have that we call the King James Version is the fifth revision of the original. I went to England and studied at Oxford and they literally had Bibles. The original one was actually chained to a lectern so that people wouldn't steal it. I'm serious. And you couldn't, if you tried to read it, it would be like deciphering Greek because old English was that difficult. And so they kept on revising until we got the one they call the authorized version, but that was the fifth, fifth revision of the original that they came up with. So you need to find what suits you, but people will divide over, I'm going to tell you this, most churches' problems have nothing to do with theology. I've told you this before, but my home church, First Baptist Church Houston, had a big problem. We moved from downtown out to the bypass. And there was a, you know, you had the nursery team, and they were deciding what color to paint the nursery doors. And there was one group that was adamant it had to be blue. And another group was adamant it had to be white, pink. And so finally, John Bassanio, Dr. Brother John, if you call him Dr. Bassanio, you may know you don't know him. You know, we all call him Brother John. But he stood up in the pulpit and says, the nursery doors shall be white. Okay. Churches will, I mean, they'll split over, well, we always had red carpet, and now you've got blue carpet. I just don't feel like God can move in a blue carpeted place. Well, we got stained concrete, I mean. You realize on carpet you can spill stuff and there's a stain there. You can spill whatever you want on this stained concrete and it's not going to do anything. But people divide. No, we need to draw together. 12, Jesus expects me to work hard at unifying Christians. Now, that's not just your church, but other churches. So we join in with other churches as we feel led to, to do joint events. So we can honor God by serving together because we're all going to be up in the same heaven, every believer. And so you might as well get along here on earth because you're going to be ever, forever in heaven. So it'll make it easier on you. So these 12 statements kind of a foundation of a healthy church. So how can I be an agent of unity in my church? You need to realize what it cost Jesus for the church. He died for us. He left heaven's glory, laid aside his glory, and came down here to earth. And he could have called 10,000 legions of angels to rescue him and take him back up. He didn't have to go through the cross. But he chose to it for us. And so if the last statements of Jesus that they shall be one as we are one, was that important to him that that's recorded just before he goes to be taken prisoner and executed, it should resonate in our hearts how important it is to our Savior. So whether you like it or not, you're commissioned for that by God. It's interesting. It's a challenge to all of us. So how can I be an agent of unity in my church? First, focus, get this, focus on what we share, not the differences. Focus on what we share, not the differences. You know, we're always good at finding differences, aren't we? No, then what are the items we share we agree to? In Romans 14, 19, let us concentrate on things which create harmony and growth of our fellowship together. So that's what you concentrate on. What creates harmony? What causes growth in the fellowship? What do I need to do to make that happen? Now, what about what does concentrate mean? It means give your full attention. What you give your full attention to, that is what's important to you. 
And that's, I know um, during my time out, there were really no sermon notes, but we got them back Sunday morning here, okay? So that, that way you'll remember it better because you've got those notes and you can review it later. So, so God wants us to concentrate on things that we share, not our differences. Because, you know, it's pretty easy to find differences. You know, what else? It's really easy to find faults in people. I mean, that, that's easy. You know, what do we share? How do we agree? Now, in Ephesians 4, he gives us six, no, actually seven big things in common. In Ephesians 4, 4 through 6. There is only one body and one spirit. We have been called to one hope. There is only one Lord, one faith, one baptism, and only one God, who is Father of us all, who is over all and through all and is in all. So notice those seven things. First, we're one body, Jesus Christ on earth, is the church. Now that's in and out of every denomination. And don't, don't fall in this failure. Oh, my name is on the church roll, so I'm going to heaven. No, the Bible says you want your name written in the Lamb's book of life, Revelation chapter 20, verse 15. That's where I want my name written in the Lamb's book of life. Everything else is worthless. Worthless. That's where you want your name written. And once God writes your name there, nobody can erase it. Nobody can take out your name. It doesn't matter what man says. Man says, oh, I, you're excommunicated from the church. So? Well, you're no longer a member of this church. So? If my name is written in the land's book of life, that's all I care. But the other side is I'm supposed to be in harmony with my church family. So we got to work hard at that. So we've got one body. Second, there's one spirit. The same Holy Spirit is given to every believer. So how does he do that? He's God. You've got God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. So that God can be everywhere at one time, and he resides in you. Now some people say, well... It was 20 years before I got the Holy Spirit. No, he was in there. You just were, you know, if you don't allow him to have reign of your life, he'll just stay there. But you won't get the blessings. You won't get the joy. You won't get the love that you're supposed to share. The Holy Spirit is there. you got to let him take control. And notice we have one hope. And what's our hope? The second coming of Jesus. You know, we've been praying and each generation almost comes up like, well, the time is right now. Well, it looks pretty good that the time is now. There were people in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, they thought, well, Jesus come back now, so we're going to sit back here and you're just going to look at the sky. And know what, he, know what Paul said? If you don't work, you don't eat. You go, what? Yeah. If you think Jesus is coming back very soon, what should you be doing? Sharing the good news with as many as you can because the time is short. Uh, I've been, uh, the, the Blessing family, I've known Ken Laramore, that's her father, for 40 or 50 years. And uh, Bria has been over there in Ukraine, she and her husband, in Ukraine, they've been ministering there for years, and now they, got, they have people coming through every day on their way to Poland, and they, they give them a place to sleep, they wash the clothes, they wash the bed sheets. I mean, they had to get a new wash machine, and the salesman gave them $200 off. And so they even showed a picture of the wash machine. <laughs> so if you're on the Facebook Messenger, or if you're a Facebook friend of mine, you can see the updates from the Blessing family, what is actually going on in Ukraine. And of course, there are missionaries over there, so everybody comes to their house, what happens? They learn about Jesus. And many of them are believers, but some of them are not, but all of them get ministered to. So, what should you be doing if you think Jesus is coming back really soon? Sharing the good news with as many as you can. 
Now we have one faith. Now that one faith is contained right here. It's written about here in this book. So there's not many books to go to. You've got one book. Although it means Biblis, the Bible means Biblis, which means books. And there's 66 books in the Bible. And of course the Revelation is the last. And so it sets the parameters of our faith that there's one of all these things I'm talking about are found in the Scripture. And the thing about God, He doesn't change. You realize people change in life. One time they're over here and then they're over here. You go, where are they going? God is always consistent in how He deals with us. Now there's one baptism. So you say, well, I sinned, so i got to go baptize again. No, one baptism is sufficient. Then you come to God for forgiveness of your sins, but one baptism is enough. And we have one God. There's not many gods to go around. There's only one God. But he's represented God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. All three are three identities and yet one God, period. So we share the same salvation, same forgiveness, same grace, same mercy, same life, same future. We're going to be in heaven. So these factors are hugely important that we're, the things we share, the things we agree on, so we can come together. But unity is not uniformity. Did you hear that? Unity is not uniformity. It's not like, well, this is the point of view and everybody's got to be in this point of view. No. That is a weak position. You need because you know what? God speaks to all of us if we listen. And what I find is God will give me a vision, what needs to be done, but then there, it's an overall vision. But then other people join in with me, and what happens? God shows them things that he didn't show me. And he directs things and, and brings talent and abilities that I don't have. And so therefore we together are the body of Christ, and together we work together for God's glory. And sometimes it's kind of like the story of the emperor with no clothes. You know, everybody's saying only a fool doesn't see the clothes until a little five-year-old goes, hey, why didn't he wear any clothes? <laughs> you know, you need people who can give an, another perspective and go, that's not going to work. One thing my father did in his career, he was a pipe designer. It's similar to an engineer, but he doesn't have the stamp. But he would work on plants. And these guys in Britain had developed this massive plant, and they, my father was, quote, late in his career, a checker. He would check over everything to make sure it would all work. And uh, so when he finished checking it, he wrote in his report, you need to change these things or this will blow up. Yeah. If they built it the way they designed it, there was, a, there was about three or four flaws that it would, actually the plant would blow up in petrochemicals. So just because you think it all, you know, you got it planned out, everything just right, you need to make sure you listen to others that have a different perspective so that you can come up with the best decision in life. In uh, Romans 14, verse 1. Welcome with open arms fellow believers who don't see things the way you do. Hmm. And don't jump all over them every time they do or say something you don't agree with. They have their own history to deal with. Treat them gently. Now, that has to do with people from different perspectives, but also, you got to watch this. There's people that hurt other people. And when I find hurt people tend to hurt other people. And so you need to find out what, what is their background, what's their history, what have they been through, and help them walk through that. Notice I said walk through it, not walk over it. You know, you've got to walk through it every day, and different pains take different periods of time. I know, know my cousin, uh, like I just went through this quadruple bypass surgery, I lost 30 pounds. I do not recommend it as a weight loss program, but that's the result. Uh, but my cousin, uh, Jim Grice, after he had this surgery, he had 
issues with depression. And the way he worked that, he walked up to the gate every day on his ranch, and finally he, he dealt with it. But I, myself, nor my cousin Johnny, his brother, had those issues. But different people going through the things have different reactions to what you've been through. And so when somebody is really irritating you, you know, that person really is, trying to find out what's going on. And, and um, it don't say, uh, what's, what's uh, the best way to drag it out of them is help me to understand where you've been. And you let them talk. You don't try to wrestle them with a whole bunch of questions. What about this? What about that? No. Share with me your journey. Share me what you've experienced. And you might be surprised what they've experienced is far, but far different than what you ever dreamed. In 1 Corinthians 1.10, let there be real harmony so there will be no divisions in the church. I plead with you to be of one mind united in thought and purpose. Notice, plead. Unite in purpose. Plead is a very emotional word. He said this is really important to be united and united in God's purpose. So that pleading lets us know there's a lot of passion involved. Needs that. Second, realize I must continually work at unity. This is not something that happens by accident. Ephesians 4, verse 3, put it this way. Make every effort to keep unity of the Spirit, binding yourselves together by living in peace with each other. Now notice, make every effort. It is intentional. You have to choose to make that effort to have peace. You know, it's easy to have war. You realize that. You just say a little here and say a little there and divide people and you know what, how to push certain people's buttons, how to do And you can have a war going on and you go, well, I didn't do anything. And yet you cause a wildfire to roar. You know, you look through Proverbs. It talks repeatedly about putting out those fires to bring peace, to speak well. So a few things. Don't bring worldly values into the church. Because every time you bring worldly values into the church, it causes division. You take, right now, teenagers are trying to be the latest on various, there's so many social media platforms, it just blows my mind. I, I'm an old guy, I'm on Facebook, okay, you know. There's, I don't even, I, but they think that they get on this and they'll be famous until somebody else gets famous and they're off, off there. You know, as we say in music, one hit wonders. You got your one hit and then you're done. But they're, they're trying to market themselves and put themselves out in the world and they don't know they're only causing themselves problems. Don't go there. And, and then the Corinthian church, there were problems. They were dividing up. Consider 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 3. It says, you're acting in the church the same way unbelievers act in the world. Hmm. Now, he's being awful direct, isn't he? The proof of your immaturity is you're arguing and quarreling the divisions you've created. Hmm. That proves you belong to the world and are not living by worldly and are living by worldly values. When one of you says, I support Paul, and the other says, I support Apollos, you're acting like unbelievers, not like Christ. Is Apollos important? No. Is Paul important? No. So avoid bringing the worldly values in the church. You know, the world says, oh, well, everybody's doing it, so we can't do it. No. We look at what the scripture says, and we stay there. And further, don't get sucked in the world's fights. I don't have to tell you there's a lot of conflict in our society with culture and the world right now. Now, you, you notice I never say, 
vote for this party or that party or this candidate or that candidate. I will speak on moral issues because they're backed up in the Bible. But who you vote for is on your own conscience. And you need to choose wisely as you're making those voting decisions because you're supposed to have prayed about it before you went and voted. And so I distinguish between moral statements, which are right or wrong, and political statements, which there's different opinions. There's no verse in the Bible that tells us uh, to raise taxes or lower taxes. Now, I'm always for lower taxes, but the Bible doesn't say, well, either way, it's just pay your taxes to Caesar. So, you, so there's no verse for that. But there are verses how you're supposed to protect human life, how you're supposed to take care of the elderly, the widows, the orphans. You're supposed to watch out for the needs of those who are marginalized in society and help them. In John 18, 36, Jesus says, My kingdom is not of this world. If it were, my servants would fight. See, sometimes we have in our mindset, well, um, as a, you know, quote, Christian nation, you're supposed to do this or that. Well, we are sojourners, the Bible says. We're passing through this world. We love our country. We're glad God has put us here in the United States. But this is not my home. My home is in heaven. And so for there, my allegiance is to my God. So, but as Christian, we're called to speak the truth for the vulnerable, for the, those who are hurting, those who have great needs. In 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 23, don't do anything to do with foolish and stupid arguments because you know they produce quarrels. He's again being right to the point. The Lord's servant must never quarrel. Hmm. Instead, must be kind to everyone, be able to teach, and patient with everyone. I never pray for patience. I figure God could send me as much as I need to get more patience, right? Patient with everyone. Notice he doesn't give a, an exemption for certain people, does he? No. Patient with everyone. You must be humble, gentle, teaching those who oppose the truth. So the bottom line is, he said, don't participate in a long argument. State your position. And if they want to try to argue about it, try to debate it, you go, no, this is my point. This is, my, this is where I stand on this. You can stand where you want to, but you're not going to change my mind. Many places in Scripture, particularly Psalms and Proverbs, Tell us, stay clear of argument of people. Realize in the church in Rome, they were having a split because of conflict. In Romans chapter 14, verse 20, he says, don't tear apart the work of God over the rule about food. See, they were saying some people wanted to eat this way and that way. Some wanted to eat, wouldn't eat meat sacrificed to idols. Others say, an idol is just a dumb little statue. I'll eat anything I want. And they were going back and forth on that. He says, don't go there. Three, be realistic in my expectations. You know, it's always interesting to me here. I don't know how many weddings, I think I've officiated about 200 weddings. And the younger ones are the most interesting. Oh, he's so perfect. Oh, she's just an angel. And then six months later, they're, hmm. The, the strong, quiet type and the talkative one, I mean, they're going like this. Unrealistic expectations. Two sinners coming together doesn't make anything perfect. It takes hard work by both parties to have a wonderful relationship. The man and the woman got to work together. Can't, you can't get more different than a man and a woman. You realize that. Totally different. God brings us together in union. And the same way with the church. To expect a church to always do everything right and the minister to be perfect to everyone is sheer fantasy. B. 
because there is no perfect church. You realize that? Because it's made up of a bunch of sinners and we've all need the grace of God. And Psalms, and here's the thing, since it's filled with imperfect people, to minister with everybody is, is, is fantasy. And here's the thing, and I'm the number one chief sinner. Yeah. And I'm supposed to be leading y'all, and you know, I'm where you are. We're, we're all in this together. In Psalms 119, verse 93, nothing is perfect except your words. Amen to that. He, you know, God is perfect, God's word is perfect, but I'm certainly not. So everything is broken this planet. The weather, the economy, our bodies aren't perfect. Boy, I found that out. Um, what about our marriages aren't perfect, our relationships aren't perfect, our minds aren't perfect. The, one of the hard things for me going through my surgery and my recovery is I normally think real quick. And for about four or five weeks, it was like I was in slow motion. I looked at some of the emails I sent out. Here I got emails, you know, I'm sitting in the hospital bed and I'm answering emails. And I look at the syntax and go, look like a seventh grade, a seventh year old wrote this. I mean, it was, you could figure out what I was trying to say, but it's got, what is that? What, what has that guy been on? I was getting over propofol. That's what they give you. Yeah, and that lingers a while and everything else your body's been through. So my mind was, but now I feel like myself again. That's one reason I couldn't preach too early. I mean, I couldn't remember stuff like I should. And, and, and that gets kind of tiring when you're there in the congregation. So expect perfection in your church is setting you up for massive disappointment. And yet there's people in church life, they go, well, if you're not doing this, this, and this, well, it just... Because you can go to any church anywhere and find shortcomings. You cannot fault. You know, there, there's some uh, churches, I mean, they like quiet, reverent. I was raised in the Catholic church, everything, uh, certain their ceremony. And there's other churches that are, it's like a wild party going on. Well, which one's right? They both are. If they're worshiping God in spirit and truth, it doesn't matter the other stuff. It's just extra trappings going along. You've got to know God with all of your heart, with all of your mind, with all your soul. Now, so you don't expect perfection. You say, we're working this together and we're going to move forward. Now in Ephesians chapter 4 verse 2. Hmm. Now I need this. Be patient. So y'all got to be patient with me. Be patient with each other. Make an allowance for each other's faults because of your love. So as you look in the life in relationships, you know, there's always unmet expectations. And like you come to a church and you go, well, I, I like the, this in the church or that in the church. You know what? If you go to, to you know, if you're here at this church and you go, what? Uh, I think we ought to have, say, a retreat ministry. I'll say, great, you're it. It's God's put on your heart. We need the retreats. Great, you get to start organizing and planning. Oh, I don't want to do that. I think we ought to have it. Well, great. Well, God, but God put it on your heart. So let's see what God wants you to do. That happened in my church in Virginia. Uh, Sylvia Dempsey, the only thing the church she served before she came to uh, Newport News Baptist Church was since she worked as in the school system as a helper in the first grade, they would only ask her to do stuff with kids. And she always turned them down. And she said, the reason I turned them down was I was with running those kids all week long. I needed a break. And so she developed a, she said, I want to do a retreat ministry with adults. I said, great, you're it. And she put together a retreat ministry at our church, and it was wonderful. Because that was her passion. That's what she wanted to see done. In Colossians chapter 3, verse 14, 
most of all, let love guide your life. Then the whole church will stay together in perfect harmony. You know, there's sometimes in life, somebody needs you to pull them aside and talk to them privately to work on something. But you know what? Most of the time you need to do is let the Holy Spirit work on them. But there are times when you have to have a nice conversation and make it nice, you know. Do you want to get beaten up? No, don't go beating up other people. Love them. And the way I generally say is, I need your help. Oh, you need help, yeah. <laughs> you can get more done when you're gracious, far more done. So number four, no, wait, First Peter 4, 8. Love each other as if your life depended on it. Love makes up for practically anything. You know, in, when I was growing up, we would go to Granny Rash's house. Granny Rash never raised her voice. Never once threatened to spank me, although I was the wild child. But you didn't misbehave in Granny Ranch's presence. Because she loved you, and she was the matriarch of the family, and people, even little kids, respected Granny Ranch. That's what she did. Uh, and if there was a child crying, well, that child was brought to Granny Ranch. And she smoothed everything out. And it was because we all knew she loved us. And so when, you, when people know that you love them, course corrections are much easier to make versus you better do this. Or, nah, that doesn't work, does it? But when there's love involved, things can change. And sometimes, I get this, sometimes... It doesn't change. <laughs> my, my grandparents, they were married for 49 years, 10 months, because my grandfather passed away just before their 50th anniversary. But my Uncle Louie had a bad car wreck and almost died. My grandmother prayed, God, spare his life and I'll take care of him. Well, he did serve in World War II, but uh, he was... Um, not as smart as other people. He was IQ was a little low because of his injury. And so finally he needed to move in with, with my grandparents because they had an extra bedroom. And um, my grandfather said, yes, but you can't wash his clothes. I don't know why, but he wouldn't. wouldn't so instead of what he did, he washed my grandfather took over the washing of the clothes so that grandmother could not wash Uncle Louie's clothes. He had to send them out to be washed. <laughs> and that's how they worked that out. So you find a compromise. <laughs> I wouldn't have come up with that compromise. If that was their compromise, it worked for them. Four, offer encouragement instead of criticism. Now that's so counterculture. I mean, you go on any social media, I mean, they're bashing one another, hitting this way, hitting that way, calling them this, that, and the other. But all for encouragement instead of criticism. In um, Romans chapter 14, verse 19, let us use all of our energy in getting along with each other. You know, sometimes it takes a lot of energy to get along with each other, doesn't it? But you know what? The results are incredible when you do. Then further, help each other by using encouraging words. Don't drag others down by finding fault. Mm. See, I, see, don't look here. Yeah, you can find all kinds of faults. See, but see, we don't want to find our faults. We want to find your faults. Because your faults are more, far more entertaining and enjoyable to discover than my faults. So I want to talk about your faults. God says, don't go there. Don't go there. 
Proverbs 16, 21. A wise, mature person is known for his understanding. The more pleasant his words, the more persuasive he is. So if you want to be persuasive, you don't be abrasive. See, I can stand up here and get you on the defensive real quick. I can say, you need to stop doing this, 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 and just attacking at you all the time. And what happens, you put up your, your shield, and I can never get through that. But if you know that I love you and I say, well, these are the things God has to say, you go, hmm, I may need to consider that. And I can break through your shield that you put up. But we don't want to do that because you know you're loved and cared for. And you say, well, this is God's message to me. And when you realize it's God's message to you, you will make a difference in life. And if you want to be really persuasive, you be gracious. Now, Matina here, we went one Sunday, we had some unruly kids in the church. I don't know what she did, but she just kind of talked to them a few minutes, find them, and they just followed her just like she was the mother duckling. <laughs> just did whatever she wanted. But see, she apparently didn't say, you kid better straighten up or else. No, no. Whatever she said was gracious and very persuasive, and they just followed her like she was the mother duckling, and they were the little ducklings right behind her. Hmm? In Romans 14, 4, what right do you have to criticize someone else's servants? Only the Lord can decide if they're doing right. See, we answer to God. And so you don't criticize another one's servant. See, we're all what God's servants, so we answer to him. In life, God warns us and directs us to make the right choices. And so in Romans 14, 10, it says, Why do you criticize and judge your brother or your sister in Christ? Why do you think you're better than they are? We'll all be judged one day, not by each other's standards or even by our own, but by the judgment of God. That always gets my attention when I know I'm going to face God's judgment. And, but I will have an advocate. The Holy Spirit, the advocate will be there, and Jesus will be there while I forgave his sins. So we won't face the great white throne judgment. We'll face the Bema seat, which is the place of rewards. But still, there is this that we will have to answer for some of the things we did. So be careful. You know, when I judge, if you're a believer, there's four things that instantly happen when I judge another person. I lose out on my fellowship with God because I'm taking his place instead of staying where I'm supposed to be. I expose my own pride and insecurity. I set myself up to be judged by God for judging his servant. And it harms the fellowship of the church. So you don't go there. You you don't want to be, you know what Satan is called? He's called the abuser of the brethren. So you don't want to be in his shoes. No, you want to be with Jesus. Let me sum this up for you. We can live a self-centered life and the second choice a Christ-centered life and it's your choice in Galatians 5 13 you've been called to live in freedom not freedom to indulge yourself yourself as nature but freedom to serve each other in love God's entire law was summed up in love your neighbor as yourself but you keep biting and devouring each other and tearing each other apart. And notice I put, I call them cannibal Christians. Yeah. You will be destroyed by each other. You know, there's some, I mean, they, no matter what you do, they're not happy. And they can be in church, they can be in, in your business and your social club. I mean, no matter what happens, they're not happy. It's because something's within. You know, it's sad. That verse describes a lot of Christians in our culture. And we need to be the different one. In 1 Peter 3, 8, 
finally, yeah, I'm getting into my message, finally, finally, all of you be like-minded, be sympathetic, love one another, and be compassionate and humble. Do not repay evil with evil or insult with insult. So when they do something wrong to you, like they zip ahead of you and get the parking place that you wanted, uh, don't roll your window down and hurl insults at them. Just go find another place to park. You know, it, it's, it's really crazy what some people will fight about. You go, why are you fighting about that? Just move on. On the contrary, repay evil with blessing because this, this you will be called so that you may inherit a blessing. See, when they do something negative to you and you go back to something gracious, it messes them up because they're expecting you to come back with another insult. So let me summarize this real quick. If we sympathize with each other instead of criticize or antagonistic or polarize our difference. So we need to be sympathetic to one another. Second, we need to show compassion. Compassion instead of derision. It's easy to knock people down, no compassion. I don't know about you, but I want compassion. Three, we need to act with humility instead of inflexibility. And last, the last thing Jesus said before the cross, Father, may they be one as we're one. So let's pray. Lord Jesus, we thank you for your direction in our life. How you don't want us to be like a thermometer, changing by the culture and by every little wind of things that comes along. Help us pray committed to love one another, encourage one another, and look out for the best interests of one another so that you will be honored and praised by how we conduct our lives. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Let us stand for this time of invitation.